Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning, we invite you to journey with us during this holy season of Lent. It is a time in which we remember that after the glorious mountaintop moment with Peter, when Peter, James, and John witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus on Mount Tabor, Jesus comes down the mountain afterwards in the shadows, which would eventually become the darkness of Good Friday before yielding to the dawn of resurrection. Scripture says it this way, Jesus set his face steadfastly toward Jerusalem. It was to be his final journey to Jerusalem that would end on the cross of Calvary. One of the best ways for us to journey with Jesus is to follow the gospel readings assigned for the Sundays in Lent. Each year, these texts take us from the wilderness where we started two weeks ago after his baptism to the hill called Golgotha. We see the shadows begin to gather and deepen as Jesus grapples with the devil and religious authorities. We see the night falling in with the resistance he encounters, not just from his enemies, but even from his own disciples. We see darkness. We also catch the first glimmers of the dawning of Easter morning light in a darkened garden and in the welcome he receives from those he came to save. So this Lent, as we meditate again on these familiar scriptures, we hear the call not only to recognize and confess our own part in the shadows and the darkness, but also to acknowledge and answer Jesus' call for us to come into the light. So this is the third um, sermon in our series for Lent. We started with Ash Wednesday where we talked about the shadows of abundance and what it means to live uh, in a world full of abundance in a time of Lent when we're called to fast. And then last week, the 11 of us that were here and all of our friends that watched on our website uh, talked about the shadow of temptation. If you didn't get to see that, I encourage you to go on and at least watch the sermon portion. It'll catch you up with our sermon series. And this week, we're talking about the shadow of ignorance as we consider Nicodemus' story. One of the ways that we talked about last week, that one of the ways that we resist temptation in our lives is to, like Jesus, be grounded in and shaped by the word of God. So this morning, we find ourselves reading one of the most familiar scripture passages of the whole Bible, chapter 3 of John's Gospel. Probably 90% of the people who go to church will at least recognize John 3.16. If I started it, most of you could probably finish it for me. But as we consider the shadow of ignorance, we have to do so through the whole of Nicodemus' story, through the whole of his interaction with Jesus, not just that verse in 16. There's this one detail that John includes in his, Bible, in his uh, gospel, which is that Nicodemus comes to visit Jesus in the dark of the night. And just that one detail of the story has been the topic of much conversation throughout history. Scholars have proposed that Nicodemus comes at night in order to avoid being discovered by his colleagues in Israel's ruling council called the Sanhedrin. They said that maybe uh, Nicodemus was fearful that he would lose his position among them or at the very least their respect and their confidence in his religious leadership. Others, some from the Jewish community, have suggested that Nicodemus came at night simply because rabbis were busy teaching during the day, so night would be the normal time that rabbis were available to accept visitors. When we know, though, that when John tells us that Nicodemus came at night, we have every reason to believe that he meant just that, literally, that Nicodemus comes to visit Jesus at the end of the day after the sunset. But we also know that John is famous for using words and stories with double meanings all throughout his gospel. And one of the most prominent images throughout the gospel of John is that of light, light and dark. John opens his gospel with this image of light and darkness when he says, In him was life, and the life was the light of all men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Nicodemus comes at night in the dark. Jesus heals a blind man who lived his whole life in the dark, but when his vision is returned, he sees the light. Judas betrays Jesus at night in the dark, and the women go to the tomb while it is still dark and only fully recognize Jesus in the light of the day. 
So these images of light and darkness are so prominent throughout the Gospel of John that it's clear that when John mentions day or night, it's never simply a way of marking time. John is also cluing us into the depth of understanding of those in the story. Nicodemus comes at night because he is very much in the dark about Jesus. He is groping around in the dark trying to figure out who Jesus is and what his words mean and how he is able to accomplish such miraculous deeds. So when Nicodemus says, no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God, it is clear that he knows that Jesus is somebody special and that his words and miracles must mean something. But Nicodemus, the teacher of the law, cannot grasp the lesson. He cannot make sense of all that he is hearing and seeing about Jesus. It is widely acknowledged that Jesus teaches and speaks with authority. He performs signs and wonders with the authority of one who comes from God. So when Nicodemus comes to him, he uses that we. We have seen you um, doing miracles. But Jesus is also challenging the official authorities of which Nicodemus is a part. So he can't reconcile the authority with which Jesus speaks and acts and Jesus' constant challenging of the religious authorities. It is a spiritual and theologic crisis for Nicodemus. Call it the shadow of ignorance, and it's not too different from how other folks react to Jesus all throughout the Gospels. Even the disciples at times have trouble figuring out who Jesus really is. It's a debate that continues today for many people in the world. So Nicodemus arrives at night hoping that Jesus can shed some light on who he is and why he is here, but Jesus doesn't answer that question. Instead, he makes this statement that seems totally out of left field. He says to him, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again. This answer confuses Nicodemus even more than he was to begin with. Partly, he doesn't understand Jesus' words because he doesn't understand who Jesus is. But also, the word that Jesus uses has multiple meanings. In John 3, 7, Jesus says, you must be born again. The word that he used is the Greek word anothen. It is a word that has two meanings in Greek. In one usage, anothen can mean again, as in a repetitive sequence, again and again and again, you do something. And that is what Nicodemus thinks Jesus is is meaning. But anothen can also mean in a completely different way. It's like when we say then again, and what we mean is think about it another way. Literally, anothen means from the top or from above. And sometimes anothen is both, like when a a choir director like Elaine uh, might say to the choir, let's run that through again from the top. She means let's repeat that whole number, but let's do it differently, most of the time a little better this time, right? That is why Jesus goes on to explain, not born again from your mother's womb, not the repetitive again, but born again, born anew, born from above in a completely different way by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not anothen a second time, but anothen in a different way. Jesus goes on to say that the wind blows where it will. Another case of double meaning, because the word for wind in Greek and in Hebrew is also the word for spirit or for breath. Life is a gift, he's saying, and so is new life. Usually when we hear sermons preached on this passage and specifically on that verse, they're very evangelical in nature and uh, we'll talk about how you need to be born anothen again, again, again. It's usually directed at atheists or cynics as if to say, if you want any hope at all of entering heaven, then you must be born again, as if to say, you must do this thing this way. And I think there are parts of that that is true, but I think this interpretation also overlooks what Jesus says about being born anothen the second way. He says the wind or the spirit blows where it wills. You don't even know where it comes from or where it goes, let alone how to control it. It's the same with someone who was born of the spirit. In other words, he's saying to them, life is a gift. It was a gift the first time, and it continues to be a gift every time thereafter. Just like we did not control when our first birth happened, the same is true of our new birth through Christ. 
John Wesley talked about new birth as something that happened continually and over and over and over again. There's not just one moment in time when we are made completely into a new being. It's not like in the movies where your fairy godmother says the magic words and the air around us shimmers and twinkles and all of a sudden we are transformed completely with shiny new shoes and not a hair out of place. I wish that were true, but it's not. Remember, after all, that Jesus tells Nicodemus, a Pharisee, someone that others recognized as being extremely faithful, one of the religious leaders of his day, he says to him, you must be born again. He's not saying it to those outside the church, to an atheist or a pagan, but to the insiders, to the leaders. I think that at its heart, it is humbling news for us. Jesus is saying to us that we all need to be born on Othen, not just again. It's not just about being able to point to a particular moment in time. We all need to be born on Othen from above by the Spirit, and being born on Othen is something that happens continually, little by little, over time. Perhaps, like Nicodemus, one of the sure signs we need to be renewed and reborn is when we think we have Jesus all figured out. And instead, he comes to us in a new way. Perhaps in the moments when we find ourselves saying, I know who you are, and I know what you mean. I'm not like those skeptics and unbelievers I know. Perhaps those are really the moments that we know the least, the times when we are most in need of Christ to come and shine light into our lives and the spirit to make us new. For Nicodemus and for all who would be born from above, the discussion about the kingdom of God and righteousness inevitably leads us to Jesus. Jesus said, we speak of what we have seen. So like Nicodemus, we know very little. But Jesus has seen the Father and can with power and authority teach us what the Father requires. Some people still think of Jesus as no more than a good teacher or important historical figure. But for those who would live by faith, he is the one who has shown us the Father in ways that we could never see through our own earthly eyes or our own human striving. Nicodemus realized, I think, that he would have to place all of his hopes on the one called Jesus. Until we realize that grace is not a riddle to be solved or something we can earn, but rather a gift to be received, we too live in the shadow of ignorance. At the end of their conversation, Jesus makes it clear that this gift of grace is why he came in the first place. Jesus comes to the world because God loves the world, and through Jesus, God intends to set it right. It is by following Jesus that we open ourselves up to the spirit and to the new birth that God offers us. How can this be? How can it be that God would love me, a Pharisee, one who tries but can never manage to keep every bit of the law? Because God so loves the world. Anothen and anothen. Amen. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.